I would like to start out by asking, we need a little stretch at this point anyway. So who in this room, if you have been impacted by addiction with a close family member, stand up, please. If you have been impacted by addiction that happened to a close friend, please stand up. If you have dealt with this issue, this issue of addiction with a colleague or an employee you oversee, please stand up. If you are worried that this is going to happen to you and you want to know more, please stand up. Thank you. Uh, very few left. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, so we're going to start out with a very simple question. Kristen, Laura, Caitlin, why are you up here? Tell us why you're, you're up here. Um, professionally, I'm the Director of Operations of the University of Southern California's Institute for Addiction Science. Uh, and I got into this profession many years ago because my mother has an opioid use disorder that she's now in recovery from um, and was an alcoholic. And so I see firsthand uh, the devastation that addiction can place on your family, your community. Uh, she had issues with her workplace. and so. Uh, now I have the great pleasure to do this for a living and to uh, organize research around this very important topic. Fantastic. Laura? Yeah. Well, a year ago I was sitting out there in those same chairs and I would have been the group that stayed seated until the very end. It hadn't touched my life. I had no idea what an opioid really was um, until this past year when my significant other uh, who was very well known in the recovery space. Um, he had his own journey of recovery from an opioid addiction stemming from trauma. He was a survivor of Columbine mass shooting 20 years ago, where he was prescribed opioids um, at 17 years old. Um, and so he was on a very public platform and unfortunately relapsed in May and lost his battle to addiction. And so in a year, my life has completely been transformed uh, by his personal journey by this epidemic. And so I am here to, number one, reduce the stigma mm -hmm. and talk to all of you about this, because that's the first step uh, in, in changing the direction of this epidemic. Um, and number two, to educate uh, people about um, trauma and the correlation with addiction and what we can do uh, in that space as well, which we'll talk about later. Okay, great, Laura, thanks. Caitlin? And professionally, I'm here. I work for Cisco which is an American uh, multinational, international company. It's a networking technology company. And we have a very unique culture. It's a conscious culture. And several years ago, our CEO, Chuck Robbins, opened up the dialogue about mental health care to all of our employees worldwide, which is 76,000. And that also hits our families. And so we are laser focused on the mental health initiatives uh, and helping our employees and families and communities stay well and be well. And personally, I also come from a family of alcoholics, so I grew up around, um, around you know, kind of sad stories throughout. And so that's why I landed in healthcare and I landed in the world of helping people. <clears throat> so give us, I'd love for any or all of you to just Share a few stats and facts that we should know that will be eye-opening to us about the scale of the problem right now and how, it, how women in particular should understand this subject. Um, well, did you know that 100 million Americans every year are prescribed an opioid? Mm -hmm. um, that statistic alone is really staggering. Uh, this is a really good stage to talk about how addiction disproportionately and differently affects women. Uh, the rate at which women are being diagnosed with alcohol use disorder versus men is climbing exponentially. The gap is nearly closed. Uh, the way that women metabolize uh, drugs and other uh, alcohol and other drugs is different than men too, and physiologically, their bodies. Uh, 
are more damaged. Um, they get disease more often. Um, and I mean, if you look at addiction from a broader scale, which I think we should, beyond just substances and think about behavioral addictions and other addictive agents, um, kids and their cell phones and digital media, they say that kids are upwards of 50% of them addicted to their phones. Mm -hmm. um, and the changes that this happens uh, within that person's, basically the reward circuit, is extremely damaging and cause of concern. And, and that's something that faces us too. I see all of us on our phones because we have things to do on our phones. It's unfortunate we have to live with our phones, just like we have to live with food, but food can be addicting. So it's just like a, a really interesting way to look at addiction that it, it could possibly just be a behavior that you do compulsively with negative consequences. And it, it, I, I dare say without um, being light about it, we are all addicted to something mm -hmm. uh, in this life, and we just need to be more mindful and aware and figure out how we can get involved to, to handle this addiction epidemic. It's no longer an opioid epidemic. It's an addiction epidemic. So, Caitlin, how does that register with you and the need for Cisco to step up and make mental health a priority? For years, corporations have focused on physical health, wellness programs. Um, now we need to look at the whole person, body, mind, spirit, and heart. And that's why we're focusing on mental health. Because if we don't focus on it, our talent will suffer, our families will suffer, and our communities will suffer. So that is why we are taking strong initiatives to ensure we reduce the stigma we train our leaders and our employees on how to recognize a performance issue from an addiction issue. We're also working closely with our health plans and our pharmacy carriers to ensure we provide excellent access to medical care, uh, behavioral health specialists by increasing our network, by having center of excellence, and from pharmacy controls, making sure we put restrictions on how we prescribe. So for instance, if you're an adult, you can't get an opioid uh, for more than seven days, and a child, three. And in looking at our data, preparing for this, uh, <coughs> for this um, event, um, children are really impacted today by addiction, as you were saying. And that's where the cost of our claims are going, is our dependents and not wow. just our employees. So for Cisco, it's treating the whole family and the whole person. And, and I believe that 7% of Cisco's US workforce accesses some sort of, some form of mental health or substance abuse treatment. And I, I just wanna say one other thing about Cisco, which by the way, is, has been very supportive of most powerful women over the, over the decades. Um, this, the personal commitment, all of you who are bosses, the personal commitment in this case, the CEO, Chuck Robbins, is so important. Last year, remember when Kate Spade died? Yes. Remember when Anthony Bourdain died? Mm -hmm. Chuck, was, Chuck was at a Cisco, big Cisco conference. He had the initiative, the idea, to send an email to all of Cisco's employees. That's correct. Worldwide, and I, look, I read the email. Basically said, hey, I'm thinking about you. Mental health is a real issue. We need to make this a priority. And I think everyone was surprised that he got like over 100 replies from people who shared their stories. And that's what we're doing today. We're reducing the stigma by creating a global initiative for our employees to share their stories and to share their issues. We're creating support networks so our leaders feel comfortable in dealing with the issues as well. So Laura, uh, tell us about what you have learned about the relationship between trauma and addiction. Yeah, well trauma and addiction go hand in hand and I learned that first through Austin's story, um, through watching uh, what he endured um, as a trauma survivor of a mass trauma of a public shooting mm -hmm. and seeing how that trauma continued to come up every time that these shootings happens, happened and continue to happen. And after he passed away, I started to really dig into that subject and, and I really needed to understand why this happened. Um, and I found that there was a, 
uh, underserved community, which is survivors of mass traumas that weren't being served, um, that they didn't have access to therapy, um, that they hadn't really dealt with the trauma. A lot of them had really moved straight to advocacy, um, which is important, but you really need to unpack that before you step onto that stage. Um, and so over the past six months, I've been working with the Onsite Foundation, which is a leader in trauma-informed therapy programs, and we've carried the first ever trauma-informed program for survivors of mass shootings. So we'll be rolling that, in, that out in January, and I'm not allowed to make the official announcement, um, but we'll be announcing partners and research partners who have come in to make that a reality. And in addition to survivors, we're also rolling out programs for uh, people who have lost children, parents who have lost children, first responders, and vets, uh, because those uh, people groups tend to be underserved, tend to have higher percentages of PTSD um, because of what they see and what they experience in serving us um, as their community. And so we really need to make sure uh, that they have the services they need to move forward with their life and not turn to addictive substances to cope with that pain. The... <laughs> Watch that space. You'll hear more about Laura's program. Um, if you could just share, because they are shocking and enlightening, um, just a few of the numbers about what, have hap what has happened to the people who were either victims in Columbine at Columbine High School or uh, the, respond the responders. Yeah. Um, so with the first responders that went into the library, where most of the damage was done and the lives were lost. Um, a majority of them, 75%, uh, have lost their life to suicide or overdose. Um, and so again, oftentimes we expect these first responders to be superhuman. They're just human like us. They're not prepared to see that. None of us should be prepared to see that. In fact, this shouldn't happen, um, but it continues to happen. And so we need to provide solutions for people that have endured it. Gun advocacy is great, too, that, that we also need to, to pursue that, but we can't forget, forget about the people uh, that have walked in to these situations, that have walked in to schools or concerts or theaters or churches. In fact, we have a survivor advisory council that we put together, um, and so they've really advised us on building this program. Um, a wide range of, of people who have endured many different types of traumas, um, some of whom have dealt with addiction and uh, have turned to that as a medicator, but we're really giving them tools and solutions to find hope and healing. Who has a question, a comment, a story? Yes. Hi, Jordan Trevino. Um, try to do this without tears. Well, we all cry. I, cry. I was the crier <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> ah, lost my sister a year ago um, to overdose. And you talked about just kind of like the differentiating between um, performance issues and then addiction issues, but addicts are very good at hiding what it is they're addicted to when it comes to drugs and alcohol. So how do you dif differentiate the two and how do you train your staff to understand when you're dealing with a performance issue versus an addiction issue? Very, very good question. Um, y yes, addicts who are in denial are excellent at hiding, but eventually something's going to break. And um, what happens is it's not so much performance, but it could be personality, it could be just behavior changes. And we don't expect our employees and our leaders at Cisco to, to be the experts in the space, but we do expect them to be conscious. We expect them to know their employees, to meet with their employees regularly, and to even know their family. We want to create a space where they're willing to open up and share. So if somebody is ready to say, hey, I'm struggling, we're here for them. And if they do start recognizing behaviors that aren't quite right, they need to speak up. We have a tremendous HR department. They can go to HR anonymously and say, hey, I think one of my employees is struggling. We all see this, right? where you have employee uh, get-togethers, where you might see somebody drink more than they should, it may be just social drinking, but look out for that. People do do stuff behind the scenes, but they also do stuff right in front of you. So you just really need to be aware 
of behavior patterns. You may miss it, it may happen, but if we're not aware, we're never gonna help anybody. And that's where we're starting. Can I add Can I, to that? Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, as I run a company, it's a smaller company, 30 employees, mm -hmm. but no matter what size company you're in, you can help by reducing that stigma, mm -hmm. by talking about your story. And for me, walking in as the company leader, sharing my story, everyone in the company knew my story, but creating a safe place for that. Yeah. I found out about so many people in my company that were struggling in different ways. It's now not a taboo topic. Um, we've rolled out wellness programs and mental health programs. Um, so as a leader at your company, first let's, let's really normalize this, right? If someone had lung disease or heart disease, we'd be running 5Ks and putting their faces on t-shirts and raising money and posting on Facebook, but someone has a problem with addiction and we whisper it. We don't wanna say why that person's out of the office. Mm -hmm. Let's support people who are willing to get help and step forward so that we can change that stigma. And I also think having company policies in place where if somebody did need to leave to go get treatment, they felt safe coming back and their job was there. Um, I think a lot of people are afraid to mention that they are struggling with an addiction because there is a period of time where they need to seek treatment and they will lose their jobs. Um, and you see that in, in physicians a lot. Um, and, and I think that making sure that there's company policies in place and you make a really good point that it's anonymous. And if you miss it, don't beat yourself up over it. I missed it with my own mother for 15 years until it blew up. Um, so I know firsthand it is very hard to miss. But like she said, if there are recovery groups within the workspace, even if there's Al-Anon groups within the workspace, um, th that would definitely begin to change the social norm around the fact that this isn't anonymous. It shouldn't be anonymous. I understand that Alcoholics Anonymous is based on the anonymity principle, but we can't have that anymore. Um, it needs to be an option to not be anonymous, but still be safe. Uh, yes, right over here. Wait, wait for the mic. We want to hear you. What can we do as individuals, as a society, to make an immediate impact and move the needle on addiction and mental health outside the workplace? One easy way to do is to give. Um, this, uh, she has a nonprofit. Um, I work for an organization that is privately funded at, at the university in addition to the university funds. Um, but to give any dollar amount, um, to begin to uh, share your story openly, um, it, it takes a long time to feel comfortable doing that, but being open to that. Even if your story is an addiction, but maybe it's trauma. Maybe it's being in therapy. Let's normalize going to therapy. Mm -hmm. um, Things like that, so that so that you have a safe place for connectiveness. Um, yeah, those are, those are great answers. Laura, mention the book that you mentioned backstage. That for anyone who wants to understand this and sort of cope with this, what's the book you mentioned? Dr. Bessel van der Kolk uh, has written a book called "The Body Keeps the Score." The body and what? The body keeps the score, and it talks about how trauma is in our life. By the way, we all have trauma. Um, trauma is anything other uh, than something that is uplifting, right? So we all have some kind of trauma and how trauma is stored in our bodies um, and how that comes out, right? So a lot of times there's um, undiagnosed medical issues. We all probably had those. It's stress, it's trauma. Um, how trauma then leads to um, increased risk of addictions and other uh, medicators. So the book is fabulous. It really helped me understand addiction um, when I, at a time when I really didn't even know which way was up, right? So if any of you have um, addiction in your families or you're not quite sure uh, how to understand it, um, it really kind of helped me understand why. Thank you, Kristen and Laura and Caitlin for sharing your stories and sharing your expertise. We so appreciate this. Thank you.